Good morning, St. Francis, and happy fall. It's my favorite, favorite time of the year. And if you've ever been in the Maine woods in the fall, then you certainly understand why. I'm thinking this morning of an apple crumble called Apple Betty made by Miss Irene Power of South China, Maine. I'm thinking about apple cider is so strong it would peel the varnish off a canoe paddle. So, with a bit of homesickness, I bid you all a happy fall. We're continuing in our preaching series on the Gospel of Mark this morning, and so I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 1, verse 39. And we're going to start there, and hopefully we'll get as far as chapter 2, verse 12 in the short time that we have together. But before we start, let us pray. Gracious Father, make your word come alive to us this morning. Show us yourself, show us ourselves, and most importantly, show us our Savior Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Can you keep a secret? Come on, lean in. I've got a good one. Come on. Now forget it. Because the truth of the matter is that some of you can't keep a secret, and you know who you are. You will have group texted all of your friends before even leaving the parking lot, maybe even before the sermon is done, if the secret is juicy enough. Some people just cannot keep a secret. And the stern warning not to tell anyone is just even more incentive for them to tell someone. In our text this morning, Jesus heals a leper, and then he sternly charged him not to tell anyone. And so what's the first thing this fellow does? Yep, he went out and he blabbed to anyone who would listen. Well, wouldn't you? I I have to admit, I probably would. Think of any horrible disease you could possibly have. You got that in your mind? Okay. Now Jesus comes and he completely heals you. And you've been suffering with this for years. I don't know about you, but I'm telling everyone I meet, hey, I bumped into this guy Jesus and he healed me. And Jesus knows what's in our hearts. Do you think he didn't know this guy would tell the world? Of course he did. Granted, it made things difficult for him. He couldn't openly enter a town now without being mobbed. Scholars say he didn't want the word to get out yet because he didn't want any guff from the religious leaders at the outset of his ministry. I don't believe that's true. And I think that what Jesus says in the next story proves that. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But listen, Jesus knew he had a lot to do in a short time, and he had to reach as many people as possible in his short earthly ministry. And what better way to get the word out than to tell someone to keep a secret? The Bible says people were coming to him from every quarter. Jesus had become the rock star of his day. And so after some days, the Bible says, he returned home to Capernaum, where he had the same problem. Look at verse 2. And many were gathered there, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. Why were so many people flocking to see him? Well, I think I might have an answer. You see, in an interview in 2013, the CEO of Google said this, and I quote, Google is really an engineering company with all of their computer scientists that see the world as a completely broken place, end quote. You see, they see their technology, their so-called smart gadgets, as a means to change individual behavior toward fixing a broken world. Well, now you can believe it, right? I mean, Google said it, it must be true. We live in a broken world. Well, the Bible's only been trying to tell us that for thousands of years, hasn't it? Broken people living in a broken world 
are flocking to Jesus. And when they arrive at his doorstep in Capernaum, what do they find? Verse 2 says that he was preaching the word to them. Now that's important. Jesus, the living word, was preaching the word, the gospel, the good news of God's grace. You see, broken people need to hear the word. Let me ask you something. What's the greatest need in your life right now? And you don't need to say it out loud, but but may I share mine with you? The forgiveness of my sins. The forgiveness of my sins is the greatest need in my life right now. And there's only one person who can do that for me. The one who called himself the Son of Man. You know, the song that ranks number 29 on Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Songs of All Time was written by John Lennon with a little help from Paul McCartney, and it was released in July of 1965. It was one of John's favorite Beatle tunes. And in an interview in 1980, I won't tell you which magazine, but folks say they read it for the articles. Lennon said that, The whole Beatles thing was just beyond comprehension. I was fat and depressed, and I was crying out for help. And so now you know the title of that tune, Help. Help, I need somebody. Help, not just anybody. Help, you know I need someone. Help. Well, unfortunately, the help that John Lennon turned to was Yoko Ono. I told somebody jokingly once that I was going to try out as the tambourine player for the Yoko Ono band until I heard her sing. Broken people living in a broken world need help. But they need help from the one who matters. And so continuing with our gospel this morning, we see in verse 3 that four lads are carrying their paralytic friend on a stretcher to see Jesus. And I figure they they had to have been Marines, right? Because they adapted and they overcame. Seeing the entrance to the house crowded as it was, one of them said, make hole in roof, hurrah. So they lower the fellow down and Jesus, seeing their faith, says to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And as my youngest would say, wait, what? Jesus, I'm, I'm paralyzed here. My, my friends just busted. Well, he wouldn't be able to lift his arms. My friends just busted a hole in your roof and lowered me down that you might heal me. We just talked about this, right? What's the greatest need in your life right now? Jesus knows what our greatest need is. And it's not that he doesn't care about the man's paralysis. It's not that he doesn't care about our health, the state of our marriage, our finances, our relationships. Of course he does. He cares deeply. But, and correct me if I'm wrong here, he didn't come to make us happy. He came to restore us to a right relationship with the Father who made us. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there and they were thinking, who does this guy think he is? Only God can forgive sins. He's blaspheming. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So in verse 9, he says to them, let me ask you something. Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? Now, it would be pretty easy for me to say to you, your sins are forgiven, right? Because it would be hard for you to verify that. But if I said to you, take up your bed and walk, well, you better be up and walking, right? Or everyone here will see me for the charlatan that I am. So Jesus continues in verse 10. I'll tell you what. So that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And the old boy did just that. And I love the next bit. 
and it's expressed throughout the New Testament in various ways. And the people were amazed and said, we ain't seen nothing like this. You think? Now, I wonder if any of you were like me. Sometimes I overthink things. But as I was writing this wee homily the other day, it occurred to me, since we have two examples here this morning, of all the people Jesus healed in his earthly ministry, how many of them do you think were standing there at the foot of the cross as he took his last breath for them? Maybe I think too much, but I do know one thing. The grace that Jesus offers us freely came at a cost, a cost that he paid. So many in this broken world we live in today have forgotten that our default position is hell. And that while we deserve hell, we get heaven at the cost of the death of the Son of God. That's humbling to me. And I hope it is for you. Now, I know that some pastors, when they preach on this passage, they like to focus on the faith of the four lads who carried their paralytic friend to Jesus. And they would say, well, we need to be like them, and be willing to bring our friends to Jesus, no matter the cost. And while that's true, I don't want us to miss what's important here. This gospel, this good news is about the saving grace of Jesus, who sees what's in our hearts and offers us forgiveness of our sins that we might be restored. This story is about Jesus, not for property-destroying Marines. This Jesus, the Son of Man, as foretold in Daniel 7, has been given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages will one day serve him, an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom will never be destroyed. As for me, I can choose, left behind door number one, the free gift of God's grace and the forgiveness, uh, forgiveness of my sins, my greatest need. Or I can look elsewhere for help, and choose door number two, where I might just wind up a tambourine player in Yoko Ono's band. Let me just say, I hope that your choice is as easy as mine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.